It's a travel journal turned into a metaphysical exploration and reflection, contending with leaving youth and entering middle age. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee if you got it. So quick housekeeping, I just want to bring to your attention a recent podcast slash chat thing that I did on a System of Systems, which is part of the Safety Propaganda Project run by Adam Lehrer, whose book Communions I reviewed and enjoyed. He invited me on a couple weeks ago. We had a good talk and I've linked it below, so please check it out. Today's author, Rob Doyle, was on there a while back too, so I suggest you check out the episode with him as well. Link below. Today is the Irish author Rob Doyle's Threshold, published in 2020. This was a gift from friend and patron Chris C. Thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks as well to friend and patron Brock S. for reminding me that I need to move this to the top of my pile. It's been on my shelf for too long. Rob Doyle is a novelist, literary critic, and short story author based out of Berlin, currently, I believe. His novel Here Are the Young Men was recently adapted into a feature-length film. This is the first of his that I've read. For me, this was a special book. Um, it could be called a novel, I suppose, and he does. It's a collection of writings, part truth, part fiction, part memoir, part travel journal, part personal essay, part diary, and letters to oneself throughout. Like there's a one letter at the end of each chapter in italics, from Rob to Rob. It's a wandering tapestry of ideas, thoughts, memories, and stories, confessions, and obsessions. Doyle said in an interview of Link Below, I wanted to write a book that dropped the mask and offered the pleasures of fiction. Insight, atmosphere, invention, mystery, excitement, humor, vivid settings, without recourse to the made-up characters and contrived plots of many novels. Yeah. So the book chronicles the character Rob's travels throughout Sicily, Southeast Asia, uh, France, Germany, Spain, and more. Not necessarily in that order. His experiences with art, sex, Buddhism, psychedelic drugs, relationships, desires, failures, and inner reflections on death just as much as life. Techno, Bergheim, Bataille, Gaspar No, DMT, Bolaño, E.M. Chiron, Borges, and Welbeck. All these things are in there, you know? This is, this is familiar territory for me, <laughs> say the least. It's a travel journal turned into a metaphysical exploration and reflection contending with leaving youth and entering middle age, right? Speaking of which, uh, this is from the beginning on page two. On Tuesday, I turned 34. A friend emailed and said, what age are you, 34? Seeing the figure on the screen was disturbing, but this also happened at 19, 28, 30. It's all relative. I turned 30 in San Francisco and my life was carnage and failure. For years, I have worried that I drink too much. For years, I've been drinking too much. Uh, I'm 34 today, so thank you. And it's close to home, you know. It's the age where I'm both now older than Jesus and my biological father, with far too little to show for accomplishment or relevance, at least artistically, in my opinion. So not trying to have a pity party or fish for compliments or support. Thank you, you know. I don't need them. I'm just, just being honest. Just being honest. That's how I truly feel. Maybe you felt the same way when you turned 34. Maybe you will feel the same when you reach that age. I haven't lived up to my own standards. You know, I haven't lived up to my own standards, not even close. And that's what this novel is. That what, that's what this novel felt like. That it felt like the confession of a man who has not lived up to his own standards. You know, a man who is disappointed, uh, not only in life, but in himself. Not that he doesn't like himself or that he doesn't have things that he's accomplished, which are, which are uh, perfectly demonstrable just in the book's existence itself. It's not a book full of self-hatred. It's just, um, you know, there's a sadness, and that's something perfectly relatable. Especially, at, you know, this book was published when COVID and all that shit was just soaking the fabric of society. So, that you know, all of this is perfectly relatable right now. Um, it's a very timely book. I, I regret that it's been on my shelf for several years, actually. Uh, I should have read it sooner. I didn't know it was going to be so similar. I imagine it will always feel this way, but you know, after 30, it really begins to amplify, right? For me, at least. This is a good thing, though, overall, I think. I think. I'm a very lazy person by nature, and anything to get me into gear is valuable, right? Such troughs of fatigue, a factor in my life for as long as I could remember, seemed to be growing deeper and more frequent as I got older. I was hardly into my 30s, but already I felt the diminishment of vitality associated with middle age. In fact, I had always felt it, even when I was 21 or 17. Perhaps I was born middle-aged, I thought. I wondered, not for the first time, whether I suffered from an undiagnosed case of chronic fatigue syndrome, or whether, more simply, I was a lazy bastard. But fuck this shit, I said to myself, sitting in the cafe, 
I had work to do and I was going to get it done. Yeah. Its depiction of fragmented life, exhaustion, and its general feeling of losing control in the torrential flow of time is something I completely identify with, as we're all inching closer to the death that we all know could be today. It felt honest while avoiding sentimentality. It's the first book I've read dealing with the era that I grew up in that reflects my very particular interests. You know, the first one in which I felt I was, a, I was kind of along, not the same, but a very similar path. Where our respective paths lead, of course, is yet to be determined. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, it's, it's mostly, again, you know, it's a travel journal. He's just going around all these places and experiencing all these things. Some of it's real, some of it's made up, you know, relationships, people he meets, books he's reading, drugs he's taking, women he's sleeping with, thoughts he's having, food he's eating. For example, he's traveling around France in part of the book and he's, uh, he's visiting the graves of Chiron and Bataille. He grows weary eventually of Bataille's uh, death focus. Doyle compares him to death metal. Like, you know, that kind of like, uh, what would you call it? The bludgeoning constant uh, atmosphere over and over again, you know, that just kind of like, it's always the same sort of feeling of decay and morbidity or something like that. I would actually argue, and I think Adam Lehrer would probably agree with me, that Bataille is more black metal, but you know. Death metal is less intellect and more brute force, and it's often solely focused on shock and gore. Black metal has far more intellectual substance, in my opinion, but that's <laughs> just me. I mean. You could type in black metal musicians into Google and look at the pictures and you're going to be like, Cliff, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Anyways, atmosphere, atmosphere, death, I don't know. It's different. It's different. You know, one of the things I really appreciated about the book was how it captured the, the very unglamorous loneliness of the millennial nomad traveler, right? It depicts the loneliness of travel, which is something that I feel is completely um, underrepresented. It's so often not discussed as, as travel is marketed as a sign of success and adventure and progress, you know, expanding your worldview. It's actually, actually, you know, yeah, it can be all those things for sure. Travel is also, tr trust me, I've been around a little bit. Uh, travel can be fucking horrible. <laughs> and when you arrive in a country where you don't speak the language and you're left sitting alone in your Airbnb, it can be truly dismal. And you might be confused as to why. I mean, you've, you've lined everything up, you've paid extravagant amounts for this place, and you're here in this country, you've always wanted to visit, and like, what the, what's the fucking problem, right? Welbeck said something along the lines of, uh, what use is a beautiful hotel room for one person, or something like that, right? I'm paraphrasing. And this book is definitely inspired by Welbeck. It's like Welbeck and perhaps the better parts of Bourdain. Like, really, I mean, it can be completely disruptive um, if you don't speak the language and the culture you're in and you're not there long enough to justify making a concerted effort, uh, it can be abysmally lonely. But not, not even, it's not even just that. It's like there's, there's something else about being, it's kind of good for you in a way, but there's something about that kind of isolation which is really, um, kind of tears you apart, you know? And you kind of rebuild your identity back up, so to speak. It's like uh, being in a breakup or losing a bunch of money, or having somebody in your family die, or getting fired, or being in an accident, something like that, some, some, or being expelled, failing out of a prestigious degree program or something like that. It's, it's really weird. It's kind of, the, the, the kind of process of building yourself back up when placed in a culture that is so vastly different from your own is uh, humbling. And, and often you're doing it totally solo and uh, it's weird, anyways. Doyle is someone I almost begrudgingly share similarities with. Nothing personal at all, he seems like a very nice guy. It's just you have all these memories of yourself and things about your taste or your experience which makes you unique. And then you discover that so much of what you thought makes you you is actually fairly derivative and borderline cliche. And then sometimes people write about your personal tastes and experiences in a novel before you do, or experiences so similar to yours that they're, they're virtually copies, you know? Or better, you know? The, the, the better version of, of your experience. I'm losing my edge, as James Murphy saying. Now, of course, this is the minute, jealous tinge of the negative feeling when reading a novel like this, but it doesn't compare to the whole other side of joy and camaraderie one feels when one sees an author capable of expressing their experiences that so closely mirror your own, you feel as if you're reading a good friend whom you've always had but never met, right? Knausgaard was a little bit like that in his, in his first of the My Struggle books. It's that whole thing Welbeck said where it's like, you know, you, you enjoy authors because you like spending time with them. You know, you can feel who's writing the book. You know, you get a sense of the person behind the pen, so to speak. 
but nobody around my own age, you know? I mean, I'm getting older now, so I guess it's less surprising, but you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, there aren't a lot of authors there aren't, there, I actually, I think there's, I actually listened to a talk with Rob and another literary editor, uh, and the interviewer was asking them about um, this issue, which I wasn't aware of, but which makes total sense. I, I mean, I was aware of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't named, you know, which is that uh, there's, there's a complete lack of uh, male authors, young male authors, you know, like, which is surprising. I mean, good ones, you know, whatever. I'm gonna get in trouble, anyways. It's the kind of book I'm naturally drawn to because of its intelligence and emotional candor, but also because it was written in the same time frame where I was near the same age, right? I think Doyle would probably be sick of the Knausgaard comparison, but as far as an immediate comparison to describe the book, I, you know, I'd say they're in the same ballpark. Though, while both are, they, they have this kind of sense of melancholy, I'd say Rob Doyle is more punk, which I can relate to more. Knausgaard's sort of wholesome in a way that I'm not. Doyle has an engaging personal style, a clean-cut, clever base that occasionally fucks shit up with diligent intention. Very well-constructed sentences. I love the part of him describing the total futility of writing anything these days uh, worth burning. He's visiting this art exhibit in Germany, and uh, it's like a pavilion built out of banned books or, or books that the Nazis burnt or something. Like, they did, it near, they did it nearby, I don't know. I don't know if the construction is in the same place that the Nazis burnt books. I think it is, but yeah. And Doyle's reflecting, like, what, what could be burned today? And this is what Rob has to say about that. Besides, censoring authors gave them the prestige of rock gods. When a book was deemed heretical enough to immolate, did the tyrants not see this? It gained the impregnable glamour of revolt and edginess. Th though perhaps this did not apply to Winnie the Pooh. Uh, the, Winnie the Pooh is included in this because over in China or something, you know, Xi was compared to Winnie the Pooh and he had all the Winnie the Pooh books banned or something like that. You couldn't buy the kind of publicity afforded by the blazing pyre, and what was torched in one country became a bestseller in another. I pulled out my notebook and sketched a maxim. If a book is worth reading, it's worth burning. Or maybe, if a book isn't worth burning, it isn't worth reading. I would hone it later. Yeah. For Minijin's monumental work to redeem itself from ideological triteness, she would need to stock up in the dead of night and set it ablaze, a layering of conflagrations and dialogue across the decades, infernally ambiguous. Perhaps it was just jealousy talking. I knew I was born too late to be in with much hope of a career-boosting ban. You could write anything you liked now, and it didn't matter. Everything was permitted because nothing was of consequence. The taboos had all been smashed, and writers could run wild, on the understanding that their words had no importance whatsoever. The tyrants didn't bother to burn literature anymore. They knew a senile cripple when they saw one. A ban now and then indulged writers in the pretense of a swagger and virility their profession had long since lost. A cynic after my own heart, Jean Baudrillard, had expressed a similar quasi-ironic nostalgia in a passage I chanced upon while browsing the festival bookshop in the shadow of the Parthenon. Censorship makes it possible to conceal the worthlessness of a book or an artwork. Now that this curse has been lifted, art appears in all its insignificance. Brutal. And that's uh, the era we live in, ladies and gentlemen. There's a great moment in the book where he says that art these days basically just reflects the internet. And I think that's probably one of the most tragic things about being alive today, honestly. Uh, I'm ready to destroy the internet. I don't know about you, but I'm, uh, I'm gradually getting, you know, I'm kind of done. We'll see. The one American city mentioned, San Francisco, does not seem to have treated Rob well, and I can't say that I'm at all surprised. In fact, on the subject of suicide in one chapter, he says his only acceptable method for killing himself would be by shooting himself in the head. But of course, he doesn't live in a country wherein he can purchase a gun. Like America, a place wherein he says if he ever lived there again, he'd kill himself. Dark humor, pretty good. So Rob dedicates a significant portion of a chapter to uh, techno in Berlin. And in particular, his visit, very memorable visit, to Bergheim, which is the mecca of techno clubs. And widely known as the most exclusive venue club in the world, notorious for its door policy. They, they shun celebrities, they shun all sorts of people. They just, you, it's, it's a joke, it's a meme. You can look up videos about it. Um, people try and give you tips on how to get in there. For the most part, I think they're full of shit. Um, there are, there, it's, it's been a joke for years. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult place to get into. And when you enter that place, you know, this is a, this is the most hardcore of hardcore. This is a gay club at heart, right? That lets in straight people or bi people or whoever, you know, 
whoever, uh, <laughs> whatever you like, um, that doesn't matter. But, but, you know, historically, it's a gay club, right? Um, and it's always maintained that kind of atmosphere throughout its evolution. And when you enter that place, you'd best be prepared for anything, right? I don't know how it is these days. They've opened back up since COVID, but I'd wager it's still great. I was fortunate enough to get in twice. I thank my lucky stars. I certainly couldn't give you any advice. As in Rob's experience, there was definitely a moment of hesitancy from the doorman, but got in. Big techno fan, used to go to all sorts of shows in downtown LA, um, drum cell, truncate, developer, perk. Oh, that was a good one. Great, great shows, great people. God, yeah. Uh, LA, downtown LA is a great place if you're into that kind of music. Um, they're always having these warehouse shows, it's really fun. But none of this could compare to Berghain. Berghain was life-changing. It was, you know, it was like walking into the only truly authentic modern day pagan celebration that didn't stop because it goes around the clock. You know, it opens on Friday. It's going to be open till Monday. It doesn't stop. It's in a former, I think, communist power plant in Berlin. So after you get in, you ascend these metal stairs uh, that are surrounded by these enormous concrete pillars where the sound of the, the, the bass is just you know, ricocheting off, right? And there's this enormous sculpture, this white sculpture of Dionysus or something, drinking out of a, a horn, I think, uh, which is alluding to some things down below, actually, that we can discuss later. But, and when you get up there, what's it like? It's, it, it must be what it feels like to walk out onto like the, the like a, like a, um, like in the middle of a siege or something, or like in war. I don't even know if that's a good comparison. That's the first thing that comes to mind. It was like watching, I mean, cause you're in, you're in darkness, but you're getting these flashes of light and you realize you're in this massive cavernous space with this thundering music, with all of these bodies writhing, you know, in the darkness to this percussive rhythm. It, there's leather everywhere, all sorts of outfits and makeup, just the wildest shit, looks like Hellraiser. None of it in irony, none of it. Um, full piece latex suits. Um, it's a fucking blast. It's, I mean, it's the best. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's gonna be around forever. The space you inhabit in Berghain feels like vast and labyrinthine. I mean, there's like all these different nooks and crannies and rooms and, and areas, and I didn't even get to explore it all. It was so, I was also very high, but you know. It is an absolutely satanic orgy of drugs and dancing and sex, of the heterosexual variety, of the homosexual variety, of the whatever sexual variety. It's there, it's fucking crazy, and, and people roll with it. It is beyond glorious, and there is nowhere like it. There, I really, it was, you want to feel free, like really free, go to Berghain, go to Berlin. That's, that's where you're going to feel the most, like you can, like anything goes. And it really does. So, except perhaps some other places in Berlin. Tresor, I highly recommend. Beautiful, all oh, these caves and these catacombs underground and then you go and like the DJ's behind these bars down there and there's like green light. Oh, it's, it's a blast. They don't. They don't do anything like that in America. It's pathetic over here. Anyways, I was at Berghain in April 2017 with my girlfriend, now wife, and we were living like vampires. We would get up uh, when the sun was going down and we would prepare. And then we'd probably get to Berghain early in the morning to, to better chances of getting in. You don't want to go when it's like packed up in like a three hour wait in the line and all that shit. And, and these DJs are playing like, you know, the. The, the headliners aren't going to go on until like four, five, you know, like six, you know, it's like, it goes, it goes all night, right? These people are nocturnal and they're high as fuck. You can get whatever you want in there. So, yeah. And we had the very good fortune to see a guy I liked at the time, um, Tommy47. Uh, wonderful English DJ. Uh, really hard hitting industrial type stuff. Absolutely pummeling techno. Perfect for Berghain. And he's just like staring the crowd down and just like hammering them hammering them with this shit and oh my god i turned around when i was in there there's these people these these women 
uh, these men and women who looked like Cenobites, for real. They looked like fucking legit. They had like all these, these this garb and all the like these pure white faces and all this fucked up shit. I don't even know what it was. It was crazy. But anyways, the further you descend into this venue, the more extreme things get. Until you reach the very bottom, which is a place called Lab Oratory. Like laboratory, yeah, yeah. It's a male-only fetish sex club of the most extreme variety in the basement. Anything, it's like a, it's like that scene from Cruising, right? But, you know, there's also scat, right? So people shitting and pissing and stuff. I didn't go down there because I just, you know, just the smell. It's just, it's not like, I just wasn't into it, man, you know? So, like, yeah, it was all right. However, uh, in the bathroom, you know, you have to use a bathroom. Uh, they have these troughs, right? And it is gendered, like it is separated by gender, at least it was at the time, so there's a men and women's bathroom. Um, in the bathroom I'm using the trough urinal, and this guy wearing nothing but a leather jacket and like a, like a black leather speedo or something, crawls up to me while I'm taking a piss in this very like submissive fashion with these big puppy dog eyes. He creeps up to the side of me on his knees and asks me please in German, as in he wants to drink my piss. And me high as hell, like even then I was like, Nah. <laughs> and I had seen him when I came in. I just didn't think he was going to crawl up to me. But he did. Because the guy to my left who was dressed in like this veil, this white veil with this, this face that was so pale. It looked like, like a, this moon-like oval face. It was almost blue. It was so pale. Uh, was only too happy to oblige him. And he takes the opportunity to relieve himself in this guy's mouth as if it was like handing a homeless dude a couple of quarters. Like, no big deal. So here's this, so imagine this, this image in my head. My completely high mind taking this in. There's this guy who looks like basically the Madonna, right? Who's, who's pissing in this dude's mouth. <laughs> and it's just like, all right. I've experienced it. We're here. Welcome to Berlin. And I commiserated with a DJ acquaintance of mine who's been to Berghain as well. He had the same experience. And we were talking about it and we both felt as if we'd committed some sort of cultural faux pas, right? We were like, yeah, I saw that guy too, but should we have pissed in his mouth? Really? You know, it's like, as if you like go to like a ceremony at a temple in Kyoto and you like, you, you didn't do something that you were definitely supposed to do. These are the hard questions you have to ask yourself as an adult going to techno in Berlin. That's all I'm saying. So it's like, oh boy. So lo and behold, the same guy is in Rob's book. So what do you think Rob did? Was he like me and just ran away? <laughs> well, you have to buy his book and find out. Psychedelic drugs accompany Rob all over the world, starting with mushrooms in Ireland to uh, Yahe in Colombia and DMT later on. I don't know where the DMT was, maybe in Ireland too. Anyways, another story. Rob's DMT experience was remarkably similar to my own, but it sounds as though he went even further. The title Threshold comes from this chapter when Rob takes a massive dose of DMT. I smoked DMT twice when I was, uh, oh, long time ago, approximately a decade. My personal experience was actually like his friend Matt in the book. I smoked it a second time in a row and uh, I thought I died. I remember, I, you know, I, le I left, my lips left the pipe and I blew out the smoke and we were, li uh, and I was listening to Death Grips, I think. And I remember that the music, like, slowed down and shattered. Like you could hear the, every frame of, of music distorted and elongated. It was really fucked up. It was really unpleasant. And, that, and I remember the last thing I saw was uh, my hand curling in like rigor mortis. It was very strange, very eerie. So I thought I was dead. And then I assume I just closed my eyes and I went into, uh, uh, the universe. I was shot out into this vast and overwhelming cosmos. Infinity, the void, the blackest darkness imaginable, and enormous, immense, all-encompassing, beyond fear or pain or anything human. Consciousness was still present though, which is the, the strangest thing. A colossal nothing, but nothing was immense. It was a pure definition of the word awesome. As I was placed in a state of total and complete awe at whatever it was. I truly hope it's something like what death is. If so, the rest of this is a cakewalk. To the degree which it is possible to describe, this book is the closest to life as I have experienced it. It's, um, it's like reading, watching myself sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Time rushes past. 
We become swept up in life's tumult. Years go by, full of drama and event. We roam the world, and then, during moments of calm, we see that time hasn't really gone anywhere, just as we ourselves are right where we were ten years earlier, though our skin is tougher and lines are etched in our faces. It dawns on us that time does not progress along a line, as we supposed, but expands outwards and deepens. When reading this book, I had the realization that I'm always behind what I'm moving towards, right? And I can't read fast enough to keep up with the full possibility of myself that I desire. Does that make sense? It's as though the target carrot of the fleshed out version of you, what people I'd rather avoid call your best self, the most desired iteration, is always moving. Ungraspable and unperceptible to yourself, especially to yourself. For what version of you in your life, you know, by the end of it, by the end of your life, for what version was the best version for you? What version was in fact the best version? Did you realize it at the time? Or were you simply focused on perfecting it? These are the things I think about. To put it another way, will you realize the best moments of your life when they're happening or will you just feel like you're chasing the next best thing? That never arrives. And then it's all downhill from there and you don't even know it. I don't know. I'd like to think I'll recognize the best moments of my life and the people who were part of it, you know. But I don't know. It's really disappointing to discover, and take it from me, it's true, that uh, the, the whole adage, um, you don't know what you have until it's gone, that is true. It's 100% true. Um, I hate that. But it's true. So keep that in mind. Yeah, there are other crossovers and tastes in the book or, or experiences, uh, Gaspar No and all that stuff. I've seen him talk to. There's a funny story about that, but maybe for another day. Anyways, better than food. I loved it. It got me thinking. It, it got me thinking. It got me reflecting. Um, in, in the most personal of ways. And, and that's a rare thing for me. Um, maybe I get that experience from books more often than most due to the subject matter I read about, which is sex and death and all that kind of shit, but yeah, um, as far as like, you know, reading about somebody's experience that was so close to my own in the same time, that was basically happening almost simultaneously, it was like reading about my own life, in a way, and that was uh, well, it's a pretty good novel. <laughs> it wasn't, if I died right now or tomorrow, it wouldn't have been too boring, you know. The book hit me personally in a major way, and I suspected it might. You know, it came highly recommended, and I was glad it did. So yeah, better than food. Uh, so who should read it? Uh, yeah, if you're a fan of Welbeck, Bourdain, uh, Memoirs, Canals Guard, yeah, and if you like the, the black humor of Chiron and, and the darkness of Bataille and the drug use of Terence McKenna and uh, if you like reading travel journals and uh, all that jazz, and yeah, pick it up. It's good stuff. So what did I dislike? Well, I didn't care for the zanier moments of exaggerated action, what I assumed to be the fictitious moments. I thought the real moments, or the ones that seemed real, were much stronger. Just my take. Or, or just the moments of his insight or, or reflection or confessions or whatever. Um, his ideas, basically, on, on things, on art, drugs, or whatever. Um, I thought that was all much stronger. I'm really thinking about the, the, the chapter where the photographer is stalking him. Uh, or the moment where he has a knife pulled on him. Uh, that might have happened. It might have been partially exaggerated. I don't know. Um, felt like fiction. Don't know. Might have happened, I don't know. The photographer definitely seems like that's too um, thriller novel. I don't buy that. Thing is, I have my idea of which moments actually happened, but I'm not sure if they truly did or didn't. But maybe it did happen, and if it did, that's fucked up, man. <laughs> I wasn't satisfied with the ending, but I did get goosebumps nevertheless. So, I look forward to this next one very much. <sighs> Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roast by yours truly. 
and the coffee is delicious. So if you'd like to get in on that and help support the show, thank you very much. You can click on the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books about and food and donate $5 or more per video to the show and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. For $1 or more, you'll get access to all the cool stuff listed below. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Steven. Steven G. Thank you very much, Steven. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive Threshold by Rob Doyle, plus a bag of delicious coffee, and I'll be able to both. Please subscribe if you have not already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this or it helped you in some way or send this video to somebody who you think would enjoy it, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And always remember, age is just a number that tells you how close you are to death. You can quote me on that. So you better finish them books, huh? All right. Thank you for watching. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.